we're going to begin with a choir number this morning uh, to revive us again and to get us uh, ready for what pastor has for us this morning. Trust that it will get you uh, going a little bit. We're going to stand now. If you would join us in singing at higher ground.
morning, everyone. The Bible reading for this morning will be in 2 Chronicles chapter 15, just two verses. You can open up and follow if you'd like. 2 Chronicles 15, verses 1 and 2. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa, and he said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you. While you be with him, if you seek him, he will, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning back in your house again. Lord, it's nice to get away for a vacation, but it's, it's so comforting to get back home again and to be back with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I do thank you for the, uh, the freedoms that we continue to have. They seem to be eroding, but uh, the freedoms that we have to meet here this morning and to open your word and to study it and to hear how you work in people's lives and how you, how you orchestrate things that come into our lives to draw us closer to you. And uh, Lord, how you can use us if we're willing, willing to be used as clay in the potter's hand. Lord, I do pray for our country. I do pray that, uh, that you would do a work starting with us, starting with me. Lord, that uh, we need a grassroots effort to, uh, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those around us who don't know you, have, have uh, no understanding of what uh, the, the, the powerful sense of forgiveness that we can have through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. So, Lord, I do ask that you uh, uh, would use each one of us today and, and this week to, to share the gospel with others and to, to just to demonstrate your love that you've given to us, that you would demonstrate that to others. Lord, I do praise you for the, uh, the word that we've had, uh, the, all the salvation decisions that have been made this past week. Lord, we praise you for that, and we praise the... Uh, we just pray now for the, those that have made that decision that they would uh, understand that uh, that you are are with them. You uh, you want to work through them and uh, help us to come alongside and and to encourage um, these ones as well. We praise praise you for them. Lord, I do lift up our students, high school and college both. Uh, I know there's a lot of spring breaks. Uh, happening now, Lord, I pray that you would uh, just comfort and uh, give strength to our students at all levels, that they, uh, that they would sense your presence, and I pray that you would also protect them from the evil one. Uh, we know if the devil will, his, is uh, he's a master deceiver, and he'll use every opportunity to try to draw, uh, draw believers away and to, to keep unbelievers from coming to Christ. So, Lord, I just pray that you'd work act actively in that situation. Lord, I do lift up Brenda Brigadoy and the whole Brigadoy family at the passing of uh, Brenda's mother. Uh, Lord, it was good to hear that, uh, that we believe that she knew the, the Lord, and so she is now walking the streets of gold and uh, no longer suffering. But, Lord, there is a time of grief. Just, just pray that you would be the, through the be present in the grieving process, and you would bring, bring comfort as only you can. Lift, Lord, I lift up those who are sick and ailing and have health is, issues. Lord, I think of Doug Radeball, who will be having surgery this week. Lord, I do pray that you would be with the medical team and you give wisdom and skill, and that uh, Doug would have a complete and quick recovery. Lord, I do uh, lift up. I know in, in a crowd like this, there's a number of unspoken requests. Lord, I, you know what they are. I pray that you would work in each situation uh, to bring yourself honor and glory. Lord, I also lift up uh, and ask for strength and protection uh, for our law enforcement officers and our military men who are out uh, working every day to, to keep us safe and free. And uh, just pray that you would go with them be with them, give them the strength that they need. Lord, I do pray as well as 
pastor comes to bring us his message through your word this morning. Lord, you give him uh, clarity and you give us understanding as uh, we would know how to apply your word to our lives so that we may serve you better. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. I have some announcements to go through real quick. Uh, Tonight, 6 o'clock, we have the uh, small groups, life groups, uh, teens and kids classes at that 6 o'clock. That's been going well. Um, I've really been enjoying our walk through uh, Ecclesiastes. Um, Brian and Stacy have been leading that. That has been very good. Uh, so if you're not in one, it's not too late. You could always uh, start showing up and join in one of those. I'm sure you'd fit in and have a, have a good, uh, good time there. Uh, Wednesday night is our KYB and teens and also adult Bible studies. Just a, a quick reminder. I tell you what, this uh, this last um, KYB season, it's been busy, and we've had a lot of kids showing up, and uh, sometimes it's almost uh, almost overwhelming, but at the same time, um, there's been some decisions made for him, for God, and uh, it's neat to see the change in uh, attitudes and hearts of uh, young kids too. So it's not uh, not just for adults. There's been some some good uh, ground gained here recently, um, with both the kids and the adults. That's great. Vital Chalice will break uh, Brigadoy this afternoon at 2. Um, you're welcome to that. And then this coming weekend is um, also another bridal shower for uh, Adeline uh, Lafferty. And um, there's a, a group gift. If you're interested in giving to that, see uh, Tanya Fromer or Kathy Kemp. And there's also an RSVP on that. So uh, look in the details on that. And then uh, Friday and Saturday coming up, this is for men, the young men, the uh, middle-aged men, and the old men. I think you're all invited, and you'll get something out of it. It's uh, uh, a, a leadership men's conference. So Friday evening, kind of a, a late, um, a late uh, meeting on Friday evening, and then early on Saturday, two meetings on Saturday morning with a breakfast too. So it sounds like a good time. I looked at the list, and there's a, it's, we're pushing 40 people on that. So that's going to be a really good turnout. I'm not sure all the details on that, but I'm planning on going and um, I've invited quite a few people. And I think people are, are going to go and that's going to be good. Uh, I believe it's the main topic is on leadership and I'm not sure all the details on that, but just so, just so you know, and then uh, um, leadership as in not just uh, like political leadership, but I think like in the home, in your own family, in your, your yourself, you know, different, different forms of leadership. Uh, teen Girls Night on March 22nd, that's at Karen Tidd's house. Um, see her, that's uh, from 6 to 10 p.m., so that sounds like a, an evening uh, meeting. And then there's a boys' uh, meeting, something similar, on March 23rd, so the very next, uh, next night, and that's at Bob Freed Farm. So um, that's all I have on my list here. There might be more in your bulletin. Keep your ears open. Thanks. quick uh, heads up to the choir members. Uh, we're going to be meeting a little bit earlier, 4.45 this evening, uh, as we prepare for our Easter presentation. If you would at this time, please stand as we sing our praise and worship song.
Let me encourage you to take your Bible and follow along with me this morning. I want to tackle one chapter, although the storyline is three chapters. And the bottom line about this chapter in Second Chronicles 14 is about revival. How many of you really want revival? That's what the choir opened up with, right? Revive us again. The manual for revival is the book of Second Chronicles. And many of you know the mandate. You can probably quote it. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 says, if, by the way, before the if, the verse above it, says that if there ever comes a time, Solomon, God speaking to Solomon, if there ever comes a time in your country where there's famine and locusts and pestilence, Here's what you do. And, and if you've got spiritual eyes to see these things happening all around us, folks, they're happening in your country. Fire the size of what Rhode Island is burning out of control in the state of Texas as we speak. We just came through COVID, pestilence, diseases. If those things happen, Solomon, here's what I want you to do. If my people, not Washington, not even Columbus, my people in this house. My people called by my name would humble themselves, right? And turn from their wicked ways. Pray. Here's a key word, seek my face. See the word seek up here? Key word. Seek my face. Then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. Key word. I will heal their land. Because we're going to look at a guy by the name of Asa. His name means the healer. And he's probably about 18 years old. Moms and dads, if you have children, or if you have grandchildren, wouldn't it be wonderful as you're praying for them to turn out for God that they become a healer of the nation? God was going to use Asa to see that the nation got healed, and it was healed for 41 years. He was the first of seven good kings. The first of seven good kings. That means there were 13 bad kings in the south, southern kingdom of Judah, and all the kings, 20 kings up north were all bad. So when a good king comes along, we need to sit up and pay attention. Did you know this country was birthed in the middle of two great revivals? Did you know that? We call them great awakenings. And the first revival, great awakening in this country, was in the early to mid-1700s. Men like George Whitfield, who they say could be heard a mile away without a microphone. Can you imagine that? Men like Jonathan Edwards preached a simple gospel. You must be born again. And it impacted the 13 colonies. And our nation was born in 1776. And then following the birth of our nation, there was another revival. From what I understand, a handful of kids down in a, the middle of the state of Virginia, Southampton, College, men's college today, Hampton, Sydney, that's the name of it. One guy got on fire for God. They went out in the woods, and they started reading the Bible and praying together. Ever wonder why the camp meetings grew out of the Second Great Awakening? It spread to, what, Kentucky? It spread up and down the East Coast. Our nation was birthed in the middle of those two Great Awakenings. I believe with all my heart we can have another Great Awakening today, don't you? I, that's not my department. That's the Holy Spirit's department. That's his responsibility. But I sure want revival. And I want to give you, very quickly, a road map, principles of how to have revival. I know a lot of people talk about it. But how do you actually do it? It's all in Second 
Chronicles chapter 14. But I've asked you to look over at chapter 15 to start with, especially verse 2, which is on the screen here this morning. Because as Tim read a while ago, there was a prophet that came to Asa. And at the end of verse 2, it says, The Lord is with you, Asa. It's conditional while you're with him. And if you seek him, he'll be found. And about a half a dozen times, you'll see that word seek, 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 used in Second Chronicles chapter 14. And what it literally means is very interesting. When I was a kid, this looks very familiar. We had about five acres of property. And when we were kids, we'd go down. Uh, much of it was wooded or swamps. And we'd make a trail like this. And we'd beat a path through the woods. And then we'd get our bicycles and ride down those trails. We just had a blast. Did you know the word seek in the Hebrew literally means to trample underfoot? It means you go back and forth over that little trail so often that you've trampled underfoot. I wonder, do you all have a little trail where you go to pray in the mornings or the evenings or however you choose to do it? Do you beat a path, make a trail to your Bible study? Are you seeking the Lord with all your heart? It's one of the principles, and we'll get to it. Down in Florida this week, near Tampa, Hillsborough County, a little autistic girl was lost on Monday. They said the sun was beginning to set. They were concerned about her. They called in the authorities, and they searched, and they searched, and they searched, and they searched. They, they called in a helicopter with infrared, and they found her in a swampy area where there are alligators and poisonous snakes. They found her because they searched with all their heart. God told Asa, you want revival in your country? <laughs> this is the way to get it. If you seek me with all your heart, you'll find it. By the way, and what's very sad, chapter 16, he did forsake the Lord. And God ended up forsaking Asa. A nation can seek the Lord and have his blessing, but they can forsake the Lord. And guess what? Do we need revival again this morning? All right, here are the principles. Number one, I got to go through these quickly. I'm sorry about that. But God, it's because there's seven of them. But number one, you got to submit to God early. All right, look over at verse one with me of chapter 14. The Bible says that his father, Abijah, by the way, there was David and Solomon, and then Rehoboam, king in the south, had a son named Abijah, bad king, three years. But Abijah had a son named Asa. Doesn't tell us in Scripture, but those who are in the know, the commentaries, the experts, seem to suggest that he must have been around 18 years old. That just gets to my heart because I was 17 when the Lord saved me. And my, what God can do with young people in this uh, auditorium. As Isaac mentioned back in KYB, we're delighted when kids, kids come to know Christ. You may never know they might be the next governor of the state of Ohio, next president of the United States. God wants to use young people. So Abijah just left with his fathers. They buried him in the city of David and Asa the healer. I love that. His son reigned in his stead in his days. The land was quiet for 10 years, 10 years. Mark that. I'm going to come back to it. He had 10 years to get ready for the big showdown, the big crisis that's on its way. And Asa did that which is good and that which is right. That is before man and also before the Lord. That's what you want in your child, by the way, to have some character. Good and right in the eyes of the Lord. So number one. We need to learn to submit to the Lord as soon as possible. Like I said, down in the middle of the state of Virginia, one young man was on fire for God. His fire touched another individual. That fire touched three individuals, went out into the woods, and they prayed. One day it was raining, they said. Came back to the dorms, and a riot nearly broke out. But those three individuals 
kept on for Jesus Christ. And as a result, the second great awakening was ignited. Don't think that you have to go out and live in deep, heavy sin before you serve the Lord. Some people think they don't have a testimony unless they've gone out drinking with the crowd and doing drugs with the crowd and all the rest of it. Listen, there are uh, reper repercussions from that kind of lifestyle. What you want is somebody like Asa, who when they're 18 years old, they roll up their sleeve and they start living for God. Number two, verse three, stood up to the culture. It says, for he took away the altars of the foreign gods, the strange gods, and the high places. And he broke down the images and he cut down the groves. By the way, if you look over at chapter 15 with me real quick, look at verse 16 of chapter 15. This was his mother. The Bible says in chapter 15, verse 16, also concerning Maeka, the mother of Asa the king, he removed from being queen. Why? Because she made an idol in a grove, and Asa cut down the idol, stamped it, burned it at the brook called Kidron. Can you imagine that? You remember Solomon started marrying all these foreign, strange women, and he started populating the Kidron Valley with all these altars to strange and foreign gods. Asa comes along. He rolls up his sleeves, and he stands up against the culture, even if it includes dealing with his own mother. By the way, 1 Kings 15 says he dealt with the Sodomites. Remember Lot down in Sodom? He dealt with the Sodomites. We should not be intimidated by the current culture in which we live. We are called to be lights in the midst of darkness. We're called to be salt. Colossians 2 verse 8 says, Beware! Lest any man spoil you. Ever opened up a gallon of milk and it's spoiled? Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and not after Christ. Because in him you are complete. You don't need anything else than Christ. So he stood up against the culture of his day. Moms and dads, are you training your children to be the next Asa. That's what we desperately need in this culture. Young people with, who have character and character qualities that will stem the tide. Look with me now at verses 4 and 5. The next principle is that he sought the Lord diligently. Verse 4 says, and commanded Judah to seek the Lord. Now be honest, have you ever lost something? And you had to search for it. I don't have my phone with me. I usually carry it, but I don't have my phone with me this morning. You know what an iPhone looks like. And as a wallet, I have something that sticks to the back of it, about the size of a credit card. What, three by two, something like that? And it can only hold three cards. Last Saturday morning, I was doing about ten different things, and I ended up in the middle of all that, losing my wallet. What do you do? You remember we said the word seek means to beat a trail? <laughs> I went to places five different times. I looked in the same place. I know I wasn't going to be there because I've already checked. I looked in places I knew it couldn't be. And I got to tell you, I prayed like I never prayed in a long time. You ever lost your wallet? Ever lost your wedding ring? Ever lost your eyeglass? You ever lost something that's meaningful to you? And I mean, everything stops until you find it. I prayed that day. I prayed that night. Lord, help me find my wallet. And I was sitting in my office chair and looked down to my right. Never checked that spot. There it was. So just to put you at ease, I did find my wallet, okay? But don't miss the point. Do you seek God that way? The Bible says he commanded Judah. Can you imagine the leader of the country, commanding that we seek the Lord our God and that we do the law and the commandment. And he took away out of all the cities of Judah the high places, the images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. And I say it again down in the Tampa area. This little girl was lost in the swamps 
and they moved heaven and earth until they found her. That's the kind of spirit that we need in our homes. You know what? I can't control Washington or Columbus, but I can control right here. And I can do what Joshua said, but as for me and my house, we're going to have revival in our household. And I think as leaders of our church, in fact, as a church congregation, we can just agree together we're having revival, whether the world does or not, right? Because we are going to apply these principles. He submitted to God as early as possible. He stood up to the culture of his day. He sought the Lord diligently. And here, he, well, here we go. He set up defense systems, reinforced defense systems. Look at verses 6 and 7. He built fenced cities in Judah. For the land had rest. And by the way, what you do while the land has rest is altogether important when the crisis comes. And we keep reading here long enough, the crisis is going to fall. Had no war in those years because the Lord gave them rest. Therefore, he said unto Judah, let's build these houses and make about them walls. We're being invaded as we speak, folks. And a country cannot sustain that forever. They built walls under Asa's leadership, towers, gates, bars, while the land was yet before us because we've sought the Lord our God. We've sought him, and he's given us rest on every side. So they built, and they prospered. Your nation is only as strong as its leaders. Your church is only as strong as your leaders. Your homes are only as strong as the leaders in those homes. Little Asa, whose dad was a bad king, whose mother was out offering on a foreign altar to foreign gods, and Asa had to take that thing away from her. And yet he said deep in his heart, Regardless of what everybody else does, I am going to follow God. I'm going to do what he says. I'm going to be obedient to his ways. And folks, that's what we need in our culture. That's what we need in our country. And that's what we need in our church. It really is not a political issue. Not a cultural issue. Not a racial issue. It's a spiritual issue. And we need to get back to first base. So how do you do it? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6 that I am to put on the whole armor of God. And we need to, as individuals, make certain that we have every seven different pieces of the armor of God on us every day. I'm thankful that when I got saved at 17, I had a youth pastor that just drilled into me the need to study the Bible and to read the Bible every day. And he would ask us to go home, take the book of Matthew, for example, and crunch that chapter. Read a chapter a day, crunch it. What is it talking about? And God began to help me read. God began to help me comprehend. And one of the things he taught us was to put on the whole armor of God. Notice there are five defensive pieces of armor. And there are two offenses. He tells us to put on the belt of truth, right? The breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, having our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's defense. And then he says, take the sword of the Spirit and make sure you're prayed up. Those are the two offensive pieces. And so how is it going in your home? Revival came in Asa's day because they had submitted. He had submitted to God early. He stood up to the culture of his day. He sought the Lord diligently. He set up reinforced defenses, but he went a step further. Look with me at verse 8. The Bible says in verse 8 that Asa had an army of men that bear targets and spears out of Judah, 300,000, over half a million. But notice, in little Benjamin, there was another branch of the military. And they bear shields, they drew bows, 204 score thousand, and all these were mighty men of valor. Now you put those two numbers together, you got just a little over 
a half a million man army. And I want you to lock that right up here because in the next couple of verses, when the crisis happens, they're going to go up against a million man army. Half a million versus a million. Are you ready for this? Let's see how this happens. Look with me at verse 9. Here comes the crisis. And again, what you do in secret, what you do when there's peacetime, determines what happens when there's a crisis. Verse 9 says, And there came out against them Zerah. In case you're interested, his name in the Hebrew means rising. A rising one. Where did he come from? He was an Ethiopian or a Cushite, your translation might say. He was from Ham, who was Noah's son, a descendant of that. So the Cushite comes with a host of a million and 300 chariots. Now, Asa didn't have chariots, but this million man army also has chariots. And they came unto Marisah. Now, where is that? Well, here's a map of the modern state of Israel. And about 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem is where Marishah is. It means a crest of a hill. So the million-man army comes up from the south. Asa is leading the half-a-million-man army from Jerusalem. And this is where the showdown takes place, if you read it carefully, in the valley of Zephathan at Marishah. And I tried to picture this in my mind this week. How did it happen? You take a million men, army coming up from the south, and they stop at Lima, Ohio, for example. You take a half a million man strong army from Arlington and we all go out to, what is it, over to Bluffton. And just before we head south into the danger zone, we stop and we do what Asa did next. Would you look with, at, with me in verse, uh, verse 11? The Bible says this is why they won the battle. Beyond preparation and quiet and secret. The Bible says he sincerely cried out to God for help. And Asa cried. Years ago, I did a study on that word cried throughout the scriptures. And it is fascinating what happens, even today, when people stop and they audibly cry out to God when they're facing a crisis. I have a book in my office that documents amazing things that happen. And one that comes to my memory is up in Michigan. A guy was operating a wood chopper. Brand new wood chopper. And his hand got caught in it. And he cried out to God. And humanly speaking, for no reason, but we know it's a God thing. The brand new wood chopper stopped, or he would have gone through the thing himself. And there's story after story. Tell me again what your crisis is. And you know, you live long enough as a Christian, you're going to have a crisis. Have you ever gone around back where nobody can see you and just cry out to God? Ever collapsed on your knees and just said, God, I need your help? Notice what Asa did. In verse 11, he cried to the Lord his God, and he said, Lord, it's nothing with you to help, whether with many or them that have no power. The key word here, folks, is the word help. It literally means support me, God. I need your support. Help. Oh, Lord, our God, because we are resting, we are leaning on you. Ever jump up on a trampoline and you're trusting that the canvas is going to support you? We're going to lean on it when we get down. You know, God is such that he loves you. He's your father if you're his child. He longs for you to cry out for his help. And when you lunge into his arms, he's very capable of helping you. 
He had all these good things going for him. In secret, he did that. In secret, he did that. In, so that when the crisis came, he stops. The gentleman, let's stop. Let's cry out to God. He proceeded, and he won the battle. By the way, that reminds me of a story. How many of you ever heard of Lester Roloff? Anybody ever heard of Lester Roloff? Well, if you've heard of Lester Roloff, you go back a ways. He, he was an evangelist from Texas, and he flew all over the country. And he had camp meetings, and one day we were at a camp meeting in Culloden, Georgia. And he was carrying a water, watermelon. We were a poor family, and we had a tent going that week right next to the sawdust tabernacle. I remember that. And he was carrying a watermelon that morning, and he stopped and saw our situation. Five boys. My dad was paralyzed. My mom helped all of us. And he said, hey, guys, talking to my brothers and me, he said, would you guys like a, an airplane ride? We said, sure. My first airplane ride. We climbed aboard that little, small little airplane. I'll never forget, he taxied out to the end of the runway, and there was a sheer drop-off. I said, I hope he doesn't keep going. And he stopped, and he turned it around, and then he said, gentlemen, we need to pray. <laughs> I thought, we sure do. <laughs> and he took off, gave him my first airplane ride. Asa, with his half a million man army, outnumbered almost two to one. Look what he says, Lord, help us. We're leaning on you. And in your name, we're going against this multitude. Oh, Lord, you're our God. Don't let man prevail. Not us. Your name's at stake, God. We've done everything you've asked us to do. We've got our house in order. We put the defenses up. We got the offenses in place. And Lord, we're going against this huge army. It's up to you. Your name's at stake. Don't let man prevail against you. You ever pray to God that way? Lord, I don't know how you're going to fix this situation, but it's your problem, not mine, right? <laughs> That's quite a relationship with the Lord. What happened next? Well, look with me in the text here. The Bible says in verse 12, so the Lord smote the Ethiopians, the Cushites. And you know what they did? They just brought back the rewards and enjoyed the spoils. The Bible says the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people that were with him pursued them unto Gerar, which means a resting place. And the Ethiopians were overthrown. They couldn't recover themselves. They were destroyed before the Lord and before the host, and they carried away much spoil. You know what this shows me? If you're serious about revival, and you start as early as possible seeking the Lord and turning from the things of this world and standing up to the culture and putting the defenses and the offenses in place, and you cry out to God and say, God, it's bigger than we are. But we believe you can do it, Lord. Notice the rewards. God gave them rest. Who smote the Ethiopians? Was it Asa and the army or was it God? It was God. At the end of the day, he gets the victory. He gets the glory, right? And secondly, when you cry out to God for his help, he brought a rout. They fled. And finally, the Bible says they carried away much spoil. Rest. The enemy is put to a rout, and you get to enjoy the rewards. Do you really want revival? If you studied American history, you would be amazed how that time and time and time again, God came to the aid of this country when we were following him. And when we turned our back on him, we're going to find out what happened to Asa is happening to our country. There are consequences. Case in point, 1787. The states tried to get together and put together our Constitution. And week after week after week, it was just going nowhere. There was a lot of tension among the leaders. And finally one day, an 81-year-old Benjamin Franklin stood up and he said, Gentlemen, 
we need to pray. Big problem. Couldn't get everybody to agree. One state wanted one thing. One state wanted another thing. And all kinds of dissension. Turmoil. Ben Franklin, 81 years old, said we need to pray. And you know from history, he said a lot of things. I'm just going to condense it for time's sake this morning. Ben Franklin said, I've lived a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proof I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow can't fall to the ground without his notice, then it's probable that an empire can't rise without his aid. And then he quoted from Psalm 127, We have been assured in the sacred writing that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. You know what happened next? By the way, he made a motion to pray. They shot that down <laughs> after this speech. But what happened next on Sunday? George Washington led that group of men out of the chamber down to a local church. And in that local church, they asked the pastor to pray for them. And he prayed earnestly as they were trying to put that constitution together. And James Madison, the father of the constitution, said it was nothing short of a miracle. That from that moment on, things changed and we have the constitution of the United States of America. Our nation needs revival. I wish I could put, push a button and have revival for us as a nation. I can't do that. But on the promise of God's word, I can have revival in my heart. I can have revival in my home. And I can have revival in a church where we're committed to doing these seven things that I gave you a minute ago. As we come to this communion table, let me ask you to answer these questions. Do you really want revival? Are you seeking him as early as possible? Are you helping your children, your grandchildren to seek him as early as possible? Are you standing up to the culture, trusting Jesus Christ solely as your Lord and personal Savior? Are you seeking the Lord diligently? Are you beating a path to him every day so it's well worn? Do you have the whole armor of God on both the defense and the offense? Are you going in Jesus' name, crying out for his help? It's nothing with you, God, to help with many or with them that have no assistance. Help us, O oh God, for we rest on you. And finally, are you enjoying the rewards from the victory? You know, people are looking at you, and they're sizing you up. You call yourself a Christian. Do we want to follow that? Is that Christianity? There are people who don't claim to be Christians. They're happier than you are, right? They might say, are we showing the world that we're Christians by his love flowing through us. Let's bow our heads. As we come to this communion table, where are you spiritually this morning? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal